today's video will be uh, leptin resistance. What is leptin? Decoding leptin, let's, let's call it that way. Because uh, more often than not, everyone knows we need to understand insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity, all those kind of things. But we both have kind of developed into slightly different realm and understanding different hormones as well. Uh, what is leptin? What does it do? Uh, how is it produced? What are the functions in body? And why is this one hormone so important? Because everyone is yeah. always just one thing, but it seems that this thing is easier to control. Sometimes just by lifestyle habit interference without even getting into gym. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Leptin. Okay. So, so number one, right. Everybody, if, if anybody knows anything about leptin, they'll just know that it's the, the hormone that controls appetite or hunger. That's kind of about all they really know. But what most people kind of don't know is that there's an actual pathway in the body called the leptin melanocortin pathway okay so that means leptin melanin and your corticosteroids or uh things that produce activity versus not activity okay um and melanin right you can't forget that melanin is in there okay so leptin melanocortin pathway is a central controlling pathway to all metabolic functions right all of them so Leptin is pretty damn important, right? It's as important as melanin, right? And we've had lots of videos on why melanin is important and why, you know, even to the point where melanin detoxifies heavy metals and other environmental toxins. And leptin is the other part of that. So uh, think of uh, melanin as kind of like uh, the, the energy of biology, right? It's, it's uh, gathering energy. Energy, what did you say? energy gathering surface or energy manipulating surface right so it'll either gather energy right if you have dark skin or lots of melanin you're able to gather more energy uh and then when there isn't a lot of energy to gather from the environment leptin or not leptin melanin will help produce internal light sources for biology to run so that's melanin leptin is the hormone side of things that tells the brain how much of what is going on in in the body right so think of more of a signaling hormone or an accountant for energy and what your body should do next right so a couple important things uh i do have a slide to share if you can give me uh rights to share uh, and, and we'll, we'll we'll kind of uh go from there so Right now, you should see a screen here uh, with uh, the leptin in the middle there and the things that are associated with it, right? Like all, all the things that the body uh, uses leptin for or, or all the things that leptin itself influences. It influences thyroid synthesis, uh, so not just uh, influencing metabolism, but it, it directly it regulates your thyroid hormones. It also can decrease insulin secretion. It can increase heart rate. It regulates bone mass, menstrual cycles, uh, blood pressure, all kinds of things here as far as regulating appetite. Uh, this is what most people will understand. It regulates appetite and controls metabolism and energy. And it also has activation with your immune cells. So in that one picture, you can quickly see that leptin plays a central role in the body. It basically is going to influence a little bit about everything. Now, I have some things written down, some bullet points over here. Um, low, leptin, low leptin can cause hyperthyroidism. So think of it this way. Uh, Let's let's back up just a little bit. Where is leptin located? Uh, that's what this picture here is dictating. This is uh, fat. This is subcutaneous fat. That is where leptin is located. So as you release body fat, you're going to release leptin. As you have less body fat on your body, you will release less leptin into the uh, bloodstream. And if you have a lot of body fat and you are able to release body fat, you will release more leptin, right? So think of it this way. 
uh, when your brain, your hypothalamus gets the appropriate amount of leptin, it tells the body to upregulate activity, suppress appetite, et cetera. But when it registers low leptin, it actually tells you to increase appetite. Now, so that's the part of uh, it's stored in body fat. Releasing of body fat into the bloodstream is what allows leptin to get into the bloodstream. But it has to register in the hypothalamus in the brain. That's the second part. This is where a lot of people screw it up in, in their life. Leptin mainly enters uh, your uh, hypothalamus at night, right around midnight, if it's not being interfered. So, for example, let's say you are overweight and you have lots of body fat on you. So therefore you should technically be able to release lots of leptin into the bloodstream. But the hypothalamus, the end receiver to leptin, if it's consistently been receiving a lot of leptin for a long time, it becomes a resistant to leptin. So now it's the same as if you have low leptin. Hopefully that makes sense. So if you become insulin resistance at the hypothalamic level, your appetite starts to go up because you've been bombarding your hypothalamus with a ton of leptin all the time and you become leptin resistant, right? Just like, uh, which will simulate a, a model of low leptin, which means, hey, let's increase appetite. Let's increase storage. Let's dampen activity um, because we're registering low leptin. So there's two things that you have to remain intact. You have to be able to release body fat adequately every day. Uh, and you have to be able to let leptin itself into the hypothalamus every night, right? If you do those two things, leptin basically regulates your body weight and regulates all these things that that, that we're talking about. Um, sounds easy. <laughs> it's, yeah, it sounds easy. Um, it, it, I mean, it technically kind of is. Uh, when you when you understand the things that will circumvent it, right? So things that will release body, uh, not not necessarily just body fat, but leptin itself into the bloodstream is um, it in the morning is the most crucial time to make sure that you release leptin. Biggest thing is going to be having an abundant amount of protein in the bloodstream at that time of day, and that you are exposing yourself to UV light. And the reason for that is UV light dampens the cortisol response, which allows more leptin to get into the bloodstream. And the high protein amount also dampens cortisol response. High protein over any other macronutrient because protein is needed for every single function in the body, not just muscle tissue. Too many people think that protein just means muscle tissue. It means all tissues. It means bone, tendon, ligament, neurotransmitters, etc. Uh, they all come from protein. Much all hormones and stuff like that. Just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you need protein for everything, right? Like, let's just put it that way. If you wake up from a fasted state because you've been asleep, then your body is going to release an abundant amount of cortisol to try to get more energy substrates into the body, right? You can facilitate that by dumping a bunch of amino acids into the bloodstream first thing in the morning. That means that cortisol won't have such a dramatic spike. If you expose yourself to some cold, what will end up happening is that cortisol will actually not continue to go up because he ate food and it will dampen. You'll register high amounts of amino acids, which will turn on mTOR and all kinds of other things for restoration and, and activity. Plus you get a little bit of cold or you induce UV light. And now you are actively releasing appropriate amounts of body fat into the bloodstream for activity levels. And that body fat will come with leptin. Okay. So now you've done, that's actually the simplest part to do. That part, most people can get pretty spot on. It just takes consistency, large amount of protein in the morning, it sounds very really similar to what a lot of professional bodybuilders would do. Wake up, eat a bunch of food, go out for a walk. Yeah, I'm not joking. That is like the recipe for making sure that leptin uh, gets released appropriately at the right time of day in the morning. Now, this is putting it in the bloodstream. That's This is not going into the hypothalamus yet, but it's putting it in the bloodstream and everything is kind of um, on autopilot from that point forward for that day. Now, um, once evening time comes in, you don't want to elevate cortisol. Cortisol should be at the lowest point in time during that day. 
You also don't want to raise insulin because raising insulin means body fat will not be able to be released while you're asleep. So things that you want to do is you want to, let's, uh, yeah, so here we go. So yeah, so leptin docks to the hypothalamus while we sleep, usually around midnight, okay? So eating too close to bed will raise your body temperature because you have to metabolize all of that. Mm. And uh, it also raises insulin and potentially, depending on the environment you're eating in, will raise cortisol. All of those will stop the appropriate amount of leptin. So you, you took the time to kind of set up your morning lifestyle correctly and everything, and you're eating in a minor deficit or something along those lines, and you're releasing leptin into the bloodstream. You have to get as much of that into the hypothalamus in the evening. The more of that you get into your hypothalamus, the more energy and motivation you'll wake up with the next morning and the more appetite suppressed you will be the next morning, right? The, you'll have more control of your appetite, essentially. Um, so quick things that you want to do is try not to eat close to bed. Four hours is ideal. Now that's a little bit long for, for most people, um, but somewhere around the two hour mark, you don't want to be eating two hours before bedtime. You want to be two hours or further out is my guideline. Ideal is around four hours because then you have full digestion of your meal, right? So you ate dinner, let's say 6 p.m. and you're going to bed at 10 p.m. That's perfect. You eat dinner at 6 p.m. That food is digested and out of the bloodstream and not affecting glucose and stuff like that uh, by the time you go to bed. Better, but if you're someone that's large, you know, you, you'll metabolize things faster. So that's why I give it a gap of somewhere between four hours and two hours before bed is the ideal scenario so that food doesn't interact with this system. The, the more important one is blue light at night interferes with leptin docking. So in other words, the more blue light you expose yourself when it's not supposed to be out, the more your body turns on things uh, that basically makes it think that it's daylight, right? And that's not too surprising. And because leptin is designed to dock with the hypothalamus at night, it stops it from docking if it thinks that it's morning, right? Because leptin is a information delivering hormone. The information that it's delivering is, this is how much energy this body has, and this is how much energy the body has um, disposed of during the day, right? So you, the whole time that you're active, that you're awake, leptin is gathering information. Then when you go to sleep, it delivers that information to the brain, right? Think of it like... Um, Think of it like a, like a race crew, right? Like a race crew. Uh, leptin is the coordinator of the race crew, right? You have a, a mechanic that's in charge of the engine. You have a mechanic in charge of the tires. You have a mechanic in charge of the car, et cetera. But, uh, but this car can race anywhere on the planet, right? Our body can be anywhere on the planet. So how does the tire guy know what the right tires to put on? How does the engine guy know the right engine to put in the car? It knows because leptin is the coordinator. Leptin tells the body that night, hey, this is what this person did all day as far as activity. This is what it has, this is what, how much fuel this person has on the body, et cetera, et cetera. And then it makes adjustments that night and you wake up either more hungry, less hungry, more active, less active, et cetera, the next day, right? It's, it's a long-term influencer of all of those baseline activities. Um, so key thing, in the evening is food as far away as you can possibly put it away from bedtime, as little blue light as possible so that you do not raise cortisol, right? So blue light at night, the way, the reason why it stops uh, leptin for, from docking is cortisol gets raised and insulin and glucose get raised. All of those are going to prevent fat from moving through substrates and specifically the CSF. That's where leptin gets put into uh, to, to talk to the hypothalamus is your CSF, meaning your cerebral spinal fluid. Would it be far-fetched to think that doing these things correctly would also improve quality of life in sense of you could live longer? Because I just saw the observational studies that I haven't really dug into properly, but they predict if you eat before 7 p.m. in the evening, you have 35% chance of living longer than those who eat late at night. 
Yeah, and this has to do with circadian rhythm, right? There's even more studies that, that talk about, uh, and, and we touched on this a little bit, right? There's the whole fasting thing, right? Intermittent fasting. And they find that uh, that doesn't work nearly as good as just uh, restricted time eating is what they're calling it. What, what does that mean, restricted time eating? It means you eat only during the day. That, yeah. that's what it that's what that's what it is you start eating when the sun is up you stop eating when the sun goes down irrelevant of what that timeline is in other words if you live somewhere there is winter and you only have seven hours of daylight you're only going to get a seven hour we eating window if you live somewhere where it's 12 hours of daylight you have a 12 hour week eating window the point is you only eat during the day that is restricted time eating they're finding lots and lots and lots of research that that improves Pretty much every metabolic process there is and improves quality of life. Why? Because of this hormone right here. Because of how leptin functions, if you set up your eating habits to be during the day and you set up your habits around evening and morning time when the sun is not out to not mm -hmm. circumvent this process, you end up in a net positive, irrelevant of your exercising, and almost irrelevant of what you put in your mouth. And I say almost because there are some caveats to this, right? If you have really, really short eating windows, leptin is also expecting low carbohydrate intake, right? So that's why uh, eating carbs next, uh, right next to bed or at night for some people are more and more problematic over time. The reason is because because of this insulin and glucose response. If you're already left, for example, if you're already left in resistance and you're showing signs of insulin resistance, carbohydrates at night are detrimental. If you're perfectly healthy and you don't have any insulin problems, it's very unlikely that you're going to have leptin resistance. So carbohydrates at dinner time uh, aren't necessarily a problem, right? But it's individual. That's what I wanted to make, uh, you know, a, a proper assessment. Just because I say, hey, you, you, you might need low carbs, it applies to people that are already in the situation. If you are already in the situation where you have some leptin resistance, yeah, carbs at night are not your friend. So uh, we whereas... discussed many, many times that there is no one size fits all. You need to understand where you fall into. You, you know, it's like going and trying to learn some kind of new skill. If you are learning new language and you're just learning letters, when you're already yeah. proficient in that language, you're just wasting your time, you know, and vice versa. You you can't have the same approach to every single person. Like what works for me and you probably not going to work for majority of people because we are just slightly mentally challenged is that spectrum <laughs> yeah well i mean and 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 different environments right yeah. my light environment is different than than somebody else's right and that makes a huge difference it makes a huge difference on motivation it makes a huge difference on uh mental attitude let alone the physical side of things right um the physical manifestation of these changes that's like downstream, right? The mental manifestation of these things are the first thing that you see change. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, at this point, most people are like, well, I need to, you know, figure out if I'm leptin resistance or not. Not a lot of people get this tested. Yeah, exactly. There can are- Can you test for it? Yes, yes. You can get a blood test for leptin, res uh, for leptin itself. Um, it, ideal is that you're fasted for at least 12 hours. Think of it almost like a, a fasted insulin test. You want to be fasted, you want to take it in the morning. And that's also when you would take your, your leptin test if you're going to take it. Now, if you don't have it, there are some things that will, uh, for example, high leptin levels increases high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So if you're CRP is elevated like chronic, and I don't mean like transiently, like, it, hey, I've gotten my blood work, you know, once a quarter, and my CRP is elevated. And by elevated, I mean anything above one, which is still normal range, right? The range is between zero and three for CRP. We want it as, as close to zero as possible. But if your CRP is a one, one and a half, or a two, and it's consistently there all the time, uh, even though that's normal, that tells me that you have high levels of leptin, right? That tells me uh, that leptin is probably, you have some kind of leptin resistance because you have high levels of it. Um, low levels of leptin uh, can also cause things like insomnia, depression, anxiety. Uh, it can lower your immune system. Um, and, and 
other ways, other hormones that you might get in the in blood work is your uh, reverse T3. If reverse T3 is elevated, especially if it's flagged, that also tells me that you have some level of insulin resistance. More than likely, you have a, a low level of leptin because you want leptin to be kind of in a sweet spot. You want it not to be too high and not to be too low. You know, it's it's kind of um, a, a dual-edged sword. If it's too low, you end up again with uh, possible hyperthyroidism, anything that makes you hyperactive and anxious, right? That's what it's going to do. Um, if you have low leptin for long, long periods of time. Um, other things, high leptin levels increases both red and white blood cells. So if you have really elevated of those plus combined with a CRP, I can almost tell you without a doubt that you have high leptin levels. Um, both of those, uh, high and or low leptin can also make you more anxious via the pathway of just increasing um, the HPA axis leading to like a flight or flight, a uh, fight or flight response, just chronically, you just kind of feel anxious all the time, um, even though it's almost like an anxious and tired at the same time, um, depending on whether it's low or high. So lots of little tidbits, if you know what you're looking for, because, because and the reason why it's easy to do that is because of, of this picture that, I, that I'm showing you, leptin controls thyroid, right? So that's where the reverse T3 connection comes in. Leptin controls uh, heart rate and other cardiovascular things. So high sensitivity CRP, which is a, uh, you know, a cardiovascular inflammatory marker. That's why it'll show up there. Um, you can get, it can also mess with blood pressure. So chronically high blood pressure can, can mess with leptin uh, and things of that nature. Uh, if you are showing insulin levels that are higher than a six, fasted insulin levels, um, you are possibly on the way of messing with this pathway, leptin and your glucose stimulating and insulin secreting system. So depending on, you know, the blood work that you're getting, even if you're not testing leptin directly, because it interacts with all these systems, you can decipher if you have some, some level of uh, leptin resistance. But again, because of how leptin works, it's easy to to set up the lifestyle to correctly address it. It just takes time, consistency, and there, there's another modern day impact, which is along the blue light uh, pathway. Because leptin enters the hypothalamus at night, right around midnight, you want to make sure that nighttime is a pristine, especially in your bedroom, is pr pristine in regards to electromagnetic fields. The reason for that is because we, we've had episodes talking specifically about sleep and how electromagnetic fields can uh, mess with uh, sleep cycles and things of that nature. That sleep cycle, because of leptin being let into the hypothalamus around midnight, if that's circumvented, you're also going to cir circumvent leptin uh, leading in, uh, being let into the hypothalamus. So that's really where the troubleshooting comes in. It's that nighttime scenario. The morning scenario, it's really easy to accomplish to release leptin and get it out there. Uh, easy mean it's simple to do. Eat a big breakfast, protein heavy, get outside, get active uh, as much as you can in the morning. But in the evening, that's where people are going to struggle because blue light is everywhere. Uh, electromagnetic fields are everywhere. And you have to do your very best to kind of, um, how would I say, circumvent those. Now, some hacks, right? Like getting cold before bed, that is a really, really good hack. Have uh, a dinner appropriately and dim down the lights. Say it one more time. You broke up a little bit for the last 10 seconds. Oh, oh. okay. Uh, yeah, so, so a good hack is getting cold before bed. Getting cold before bed will actually do two things. Improve sensitivity to leptin, and releases leptin in a very dramatic way. Um, the only the only caveat to that would be if you get too cold, it might be difficult to fall asleep. But just just the right amount of cold, just like literally, if you 
that's also why sleeping in a cold room is also beneficial. It's not just that you sleep better when it's cold. It's because other hormonal cascades work better when it's cold. Leptin is one of them. That's why getting cold right before bed and sleeping in a colder room is beneficial. That doesn't mean that your bed has to be cold, just the room itself, right? So that your face and your head interact with the cold um, because that's what we need cool. We need the brain to be as cool as possible at that time of night to let leptin in as efficiently as possible and, and go through the sleep cycles appropriately. And when it's cold, it also dampens the effect of electromagnetic fields to some degree, right? Like it's not going to get rid of them, but let's say, for example, you, you're turning off your Wi-Fi, you turn off your phone, but you live in an apartment building, right? So there's neighbors sleeping in a very cold room can probably circumvent that because it's not right in right next to your head, right? It's far enough away that sleeping in a cold environment can circumvent a little bit of that. Um, but it's not going to undo sleeping with the cell phone next to your head. Um, that's just too too close, too powerful uh, to circumvent from just cold exposure alone. You talked about nutrition. You talked about some lifestyle habits. Is there any kind of exercise that can improve this? Is it resistance training? Is it cardiovascular training? Maybe some mixture of both. Is there anything that can improve sensitivity to leptin? Um, from a training standpoint, really, they're all about equal. All of them help. Right. All of them help. But one versus another isn't going to be dramatically as far as like activity goes. That's why I say in the morning, uh, just accomplishing just basic walking is more than enough as long as it's done outside. The, the, the levers that move left in more. Now, having said that, on the extreme side of things, right, like if you're doing, you know, training for a marathon, for example. Well, now you're going to increase uh, other cytokines and pro-inflammatory things, which will have feedback with leptin. That definitely can happen if you're overdoing any kind of exercise. Now, that's not that hard to understand. Anything that you overdo is going to have a feedback loop for, for negatives. Too much exercise, specifically from the cardiovascular standpoint, will have a negative feedback with leptin. Um because of the pro-inflammation that happens with that. But any moderate amount, you know, I'm talking 90 minutes of weight training once a day, that's not ever really going to have negatives, only positives really. Um, going for, you know, an hour long jog, that's, the, that's not going to have really any negatives either. It's only when you start taking that to abusive levels, you know, you're running 30 miles every week that type of stuff that can have negative effects but as far as the positives all of yeah. those that i just mentioned i, I believe good. that's one thing is very misunderstood is that over overtraining when people go to gym for like 30 45 minutes like you're not going to overtrain anything in that time it's just not going to happen no no in fact that would be net net positive all the time no matter how hard you train right the only the only problem you would run into is if you're injuring yourself right with whatever you're doing if you're injuring yourself that's a different thing yeah, and that's efficiently understanding how to train properly. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, only people I have come across who have overtrained were long distance runners because sometimes they just run for half a day in a row for years and years and years before they even run into some kind of issues. So, yeah. Yeah. And so that is kind of, um, let me just double check that I didn't have anything else to share here. You talk a little bit Do you about have any other questions and all those kind of things. What else can uh, some can somebody pick up by just uh, their mental capacity to process information or maybe remembering something that they might have issues with this kind of stuff? Or is it more of a like a physical where you're just fatigued and what is, is there anything psychological that may come up before you even do any blood testing? that you might be like uh, yeah yeah uh the the main thing is going to be from the in, the tired and wired type of side you're, you're almost like anxious and tired at the same time from a mental standpoint like you mentally have brain fog you mentally uh struggle to think straight um for 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 the whole day right like it's not that you can't think straight it's that your bandwidth for thinking really well is short right nine you know maybe 60 minutes at a time and then you need to kind of like a break from from thinking um that is a real thing right as far as like leptin because 
Leptin resistance essentially tells the body that you're in a low energy state, right? So the body's going to act accordingly. It's going to downregulate everything that it can because it thinks you don't have enough energy. So it's going to increase appetite. It's going to increase tiredness. It's going to lower down mental capacities because it's trying to preserve energy because it doesn't understand that you have plenty of energy. Right. So if leptin would have been docked and and gave the right information right away, your body goes, oh, you have plenty of energy. You have plenty of body fat on you. You have plenty of energy substrates. So we're going to raise mental capacity. We're going to raise activity levels. We're going to dampen appetite. Right. So. So, yeah, there is a, a lot. Almost everything that you can think about yourself is controlled via leptin, via the pathway of does your body think it has enough energy? or not right and and it almost dovetails with the concept of that that some people have coined as like starvation mode right um i i kind of agree with that if you are left in resistance you are in starvation mode because the body doesn't understand that you have plenty of energy on board because leptin is not actively telling the brain what's correct right and that's where knowing how leptin works in a circadian rhythm standpoint and what things turn its capabilities of signaling correctly on and off are what's going to allow you to figure out how to undo that le uh, leptin resist now the, it, under normal scenarios right let's just kind of roll it back 60 50 years right before electronic devices and blue light at night was abundant how would you have registered leptin low you would have registered it by having really really low body fat levels mm -hmm. right so in that you know if you think of it like somebody who's anemic right or bulimic they have a lot of psychological problems they have uncontrollable hunger but they're you know they're constantly you know spooning out their not eating a lot of food or when they eat they puke it back up or whatever so they're never accumulating body fat and that leads to psychological problems along with energy deficit problems that is essentially what ends up happening to somebody with enough in leptin resistance even though they technically might be overweight right because the resistance of the leptin getting into the hypothalamus basically means they're receiving a very, very, very weak leptin signal versus a very strong leptin signal. And that, you know, tells the body to kind of flip things upside down, store more body fat, eat more food, be more mentally tired, be more physically tired, um, things of that nature. Yeah, it sounds like uh, something that can be uh, like easily assessed just by checking in with yourself daily hey how the hell do i feel and am i and am, am i understanding it correctly is that might not be a direct reflection of how you look in a mirror you still can be leptin resistant even if you don't have some kind of physiological characteristics that sometimes are linked with insulin resistance so that's that's correct and that's why i brought up those other markers right if everything is normal but your crp is higher than one, closer to two. If your uh, reverse T3 is elevated um, and your insulin level, fasted insulin is slightly elevated, you are on your way to accumulating some level of leptin resistance, even though your glucose might be normal, your, your cholesterol might be normal, you might feel kind of normal. Um, but if those markers are elevated, then that starts to tell me we should pay attention to those. If they continue to elevate, how do you feel, right? Like, are you waking up groggy, not motivated? The only way that you can kind of wake up is by a lot of coffee, things of that nature. That is the key sign of things that are changing that shouldn't be changing, right? Um, on the opposite side, right? And like so you could you could have all of those. It's the very first video we ever made. Understand where you are, because that is the most important thing for you to make any kind of progress. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Instead of jumping yep. on, to, hey, which kind of strategy is going to work for me? You you never know if you don't know where your body is at the moment. You know, this is why we so adamant with everyone. Do your blood test. Oh, I'm not feeling bad or I'm not done this. I'm not taking... Um, the most uh, frequent I hear is, yeah, but I just eat good food, so nothing is going to be wrong with me. Like, no, because of that, most likely you are absolutely ignorant towards things that might be very, very wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the simple things that I just said, today right as far as like 
how do we start undoing leptin resistance? Some of it has almost nothing to do with what you ate. It has to do when you ate it and the environment that you ate it in, mm -hmm. right? It has almost nothing with, you know, that food is good and that food is bad. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the timing of your food plays a more crucial role than people give it credit for. And the amount of food that you eat plays a bigger role than the food itself, right? The type of food. Um, I mean, uh, some people, you know, especially females, they're like, oh, I can't get, you know, 50 grams of protein in in the morning. I'm like, well, why not? Well, I'm not really hungry. I'm like, okay, well, let's figure out a way to get 50 grams of protein in, even if that's a shake. Like, that, that's not ideal, right? But I want to start the process of lots of amino acids and then get your ass outside and move move around, right? If that means that it, you have to do it for with a shake for the first three weeks, let's do it with a shake for the first three weeks. Eventually, you're going to get sick of that shake, right? So, so, so then, then you'll go. Well, what else can I eat? Well, let's let's eat some some bacon. Let's eat some sausage. Let's eat some steak. Let's eat some eggs, right? Whatever you want. It just needs to be a protein source. But that's what I'm saying. Like the 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 type of food matters less than the timing and the quantities of certain foods at specific times of the day because of how leptin is linked to your circadian rhythm and not necessarily your macronutrients or this food is healthy or that food is 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 not healthy. That's not really what this is about. That's not what controls it. And we see it more and more often. Like I mentioned that studies that just came out about like, hey, if you don't eat late in the evening, you're most likely going to have higher quality of life later in your life uh, goes completely against everyone who is doing fasting and we already made a video where you were discussing autophagy and apoptosis and how people are misled about what it actually means uh, so yeah it's more looks like if you did already what professional bodybuilders do for last god knows how many decades you might be starting to look like them <laughs> it's not all yeah, just the I mean, facts, what they take and what not they actually have figured out ways how to make everything more efficient and maybe we need to start actually looking into understanding why it works better for them instead of just ignoring all that part yeah yeah and and again not they don't have everything right but they they got a lot of things right right like for example going to the gym even if it's late at night that may or may not be advisable depending on where you're at if you're left in resistance, I would actually tell you, nah, I don't want you to go to the gym late at night. I actually, if you don't go to the gym, I'm actually totally okay with that. Let's just make sure that food intake is appropriate to a lower calorie output, right? The calorie, that is where calories in versus calories out thinking does help, right? With people that are trying to get fixed. But once you're active and stuff like that, right? You can bend the rules a little bit because you have more room for that. Yeah, you become a completely different creature now. So, you know. Yeah. We, we always keep reminding it. If you, if you are somewhere where you are not able to kind of work out and do as many things as, as someone who is more, more advanced does, get your habits right first and then everything else. Yes. Habits trump everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, David, thanks for your time uh, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.